Yeah, the, this morning um, I've uh, teamed up with uh, Jen Janicek to share with you an opportunity to uh, be sent to the country of Guatemala in Central America and share with you some of the things that has been done and some of the ways that God is working uh, in that part of the world and perhaps how maybe God could work in and through you and our congregation collectively at The Rock to continue that partnership in this part of the world. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen, and she's going to share a little bit, and then I'm going to share a little bit, and uh, then we'll see where where God leads us. So let's uh, welcome Jen. We've been serving in uh, an area called Dematalan Lake, and in that area, it's about 45 minutes from Guatemala City, and we have been working with a ministry there called Santa Cruz, or in English, called Holy Cross. That house was donated to the Lutheran Church, and a Lutheran doctor took over the ministry and started an outreach clinic for the people that lived in that area that didn't have access to health care. Over the years, that ministry has grown from not just being healthcare, but then turning into a kids' club where kids had a safe place to go after school and to receive tutoring. And more recently, within the last three years, they've also built a church on this property as well. So now there's a, a church, medical clinic, and after school kids' club. So it's really neat to see how this area has grown. And Dr. Elry and his wife Liz are an amazing example of missional living and do some phenomenal things in this area. The lake that you see there, that is actually the lake that you can see from the house. The, your, the house is right on the lake, the church is next door, and the dorms where the mission teams are right above it. As you can see, people are doing laundry in that lake, people bathe in that lake, they wash their dishes in that lake, um, they're even drinking the water. It's not safe for people to be using that water because it is so polluted, but they do. As you're standing up on the top of the dorms, on the top of the church, if you look to your right, you see the lake. You look to the left, this is what you see. These are the houses of the people that we work with in this ministry. It's essentially corrugated tin structures separated by tin pieces of metal. And their houses are just stacked one upon the other. This is actually a railroad that they built these houses on. About 20 years ago, the railroad stopped running in Guatemala, and they decided to use semi-trucks instead. We could have a whole conversation about maybe why that wasn't a good idea, but there was land not being used. So people that were forced out of their homes because of civil unrest, poli uh, political corruption, or even maybe a volcano eruption, needed to find a new place to live. And so they built their homes on this land that they don't own. You probably have heard about some volcanoes. There's been two this year that have erupted. Um, and back in 2010, there was another big eruption. And Mike and I have both seen the devastation effects of what a eruption does in these communities. We were in a village that uh, was affected by the 2010 eruption, and they still haven't been able to rebuild. Their community center is still roofless. Their churches aren't put back together. So seeing this and hearing about more eruptions happening this year, it's, it's devastating to hear about. I'd like you to see an inside of one of the homes that we have visited. Um, the, the people that we live with, this is what the inside of their houses might look like. This house actually had a refrigerator, um, and they spliced some electricity from a nearby line that wasn't their own. There's an example of one of their outhouses or bathrooms they have. And a, a typical kitchen. They don't have running water to their homes. And so this is just a place where they use where they can haul water and then they have a place to wash their dishes or to uh, prepare meals. As you can see, they're very materialistically impoverished. But honestly, the people in Guatemala are some of the happiest people I've ever met. What they lack in material, material items, they have made up in the relationships that they have built. Here in the U.S., we're very time dependent. We're go, go, go. We want to get a lot of things done. There, it's not that way. They don't care about the time. They care about the relationships and the people that they're with. This is a picture of one of the schools. 
Education in Guatemala is definitely lacking. About half of the population cannot read or write. 40% of the kids don't even start what would be equivalent to first grade here in the US. One in 100 girls completes sixth grade. And 90% of these children are malnourished. Education is definitely a need in Guatemala and also the empowerment to get girls to, to stay in school and to finish school. The trips that I have led have been very health education focused and medical focused. We've taken um, medical professionals with us on these trips and have led medical clinics and some of our Concordia students have been able to come alongside them and to help with, with those clinics, particularly students that are interested in going into healthcare. I've also taken students that are interested on the public health side and want to improve some of the, the hygiene and health issues that are uh, plaguing the communities. So for example, the top, I think it's your left picture, is an example of a ventilated stove. One of the big health issues there is uh, respiratory disease because they cook over an open flame and they're breathing in the smoke all day long. So we went into a village and we... Um, help to build some ventilated stoves that take a lot less firewood, so environmentally it's, it's better, and then also without the smoke, it's better. The stove you see there isn't completely ventilated out of the house yet. Once the picture is taken, we finish the process. Latrines, another issue. Some of the villages we've been in, not every home has their own bathroom. And so we picked some of the, actually we had the, the, the leader of the village pick some of the homes that had the greatest needs and we went in and helped them build the latrines so they could just have an open pit, simple latrine to have that dignity and privacy of, of having their own bathroom. Education is a huge part of our trips as well. We've done a lot of things just to um, educate on health and hygiene. Washing your hands, why that's so important. And for us, as Americans, to realize some of the barriers. If they don't have access to water, it's really hard to wash your hands. So learning about those things, talking about germs, teaching the kids about dental hygiene, teaching them about nutrition, teaching them about parasites and running around without shoes on and how that can create problems, how to treat diarrhea so we don't have children dying from it. We've gone and have done a lot of different education, and uh, it's been pretty neat to see. Another part of every one of our trips is to do some children's ministry opportunities. We have a captive audience that is so excited to see their special visitors, and we often get opportunities to play with the kids, to do a vacation Bible school type activities with them, and also the moms. The moms are around a lot too, so we're able to do a lot to empower and to equip some of the moms. The pictures you see here, we're playing Pato Pato Gonzo, Duck Duck Goose. Um, reading to them some Spanish books, and that little boy on the, the right, he's on a rollerblade. I just think how ingenious it is that he was on a rollerblade rolling down the mountain, and uh, just to see that the way that they play and how creative they can get there. Uh, we've had some other groups beyond the education groups, the health education groups from, from Concordia Go, and they have been specific on education and teaching English. So there's been a couple other groups from, from Concordia as well. Each part of the trips that we take also include a cultural part. And students get to see how tortillas are made and get to eat some typical Guatemalan food. Typically, we have a tour stay to go to Antigua or hike a volcano or do some other fun activities. This past May, I was blessed to be able to take my family to Guatemala. It's something that I had been praying about for a long time. They've seen the pictures. They keep wondering why mom keeps wanting to go back. So it was neat to get to, to share that experience with them. The picture on the left is special. And I, I wanted to tell you about it, even though it's not specifically related um, to the opportunity to present to you all. But when we were there in May, we got to meet our Compassion International child. It's a little girl in the black coat in the front. And that was such a neat opportunity to get to see the money that we are sending and sponsoring for this little girl and to see how her life has changed. If any of you have questions about Compassion International, I would love to have the opportunity to talk to you about that. Um, we also got to, to experience life in Amatalan Lake and to um, introduce my family to some of the people I have fallen in love with, specifically Dr. Ellery and Liz. 
Um, and as you can see there, Broxton with his little friend Melvin that he met while he was there. The day my family left Guatemala in May, I stayed behind, and Pastor Mike and some of my colleagues from Concordia came and joined me for a second week to do an exploratory trip. I'm going to let Pastor Mike tell you more about that. Yeah, so the the first, it was my first time being in uh, Guatemala as well as even outside of the United States, and one of the things that was interesting uh, for me is the reception that we received when we arrived in in the country uh, itself. Uh, because the reason we went over there was to just uh, try to develop relationships and see what was going on in the country, specifically in the village of El Pepinal is where we were we were headed to, to see what the community leaders were doing and how we could come alongside them, not to fix all their problems, but to come alongside them perhaps with, with insight, with with uh, resources, and also mainly with hope. And when we got there, um, we're coming along, we call this an exploratory trip, just to see what what was going on, make relationships. And when when we we got there through a different connection, we got to meet the mayor of Amadanlan. It's a city of about 400,000 people. And we got to go into the city council chambers, and the mayor came in and talked to us. And you know what she wanted to say? Thank you. We hadn't even done anything. We had been there less than 24 hours, and she wanted to thank us for being there because she was thanking us um, as we, to her, were a representative of a lot of the teams from the United States that came to Guatemala to, to help the people, to give them hope uh, for, for tomorrow and, and for the future. They literally treated us like foreign dignitaries. I mean, it was, it was, in, it was incredible. And we felt like, hey, we're just, we haven't done anything. All the work was done be, before us. But it was their way of saying thank you uh, to us. And we got to go into this, uh, this uh, gathering of different uh, organizations within Guatemala. It was like a conference. And they stopped the conference for us when we got there and had us stand so they could recognize us. And this whole crowd of people that we didn't know, that we've only, remember, we've only been there less than 24 hours in the country, they all got to their feet and they clapped and thanked us for coming to their country to, to bring help and to bring hope. Just amazing. I mean, we felt like, no, we don't deserve this. But isn't that what grace is all about? We don't deserve the grace that God gives us, but he gives it to us anyway. And we respond to that grace in being sent and, and, and being those instruments that God works in and through to bring hope and to bring help. One of the things that we we did there is we got to see, meet the 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 mayor of uh, El Pepinal as well as the the city council and as Jen mentioned before the effects of the 2010 volcano are still very prevalent in this uh, village of about 700 their community center which you see there is is roofless they had another group pr- prior to us coming had come to help them uh, clean up the damage from the ash that had fell on the building and had collapsed the roof so they got that out so they want to rebuild that here is the the uh, inside of their uh, Catholic church that's there, again, roofless. They were working on it when we were there. They would like to get that reestablished. This, the country of Guatemala is predominantly Roman Catholic. However, there is one priest for every, I think, 42 parishes within the country. So they don't often get to worship together in community with their forever family, like we get to do, that we're privileged to do here every week. So we got to see that. Uh, but, the, but the main thing that, that I enjoyed most of all was the interaction with the people. And we got to spend some time seeing what life was like for the school, the school children, because um, those, those are the ones that are going to be the hope for the future. And the things that they, that they learn in, in school and, and what they do, uh, I also noticed on some of the desks that uh, some of the uh, other influences of evil and Satan are there too. I witnessed for myself a inscription on one of the desks, MS-13. You know what that is, right? Mm-hmm. A gang. Very powerful uh, drug gang in uh, Central America. And so it's prevalent right there. And so these kids are exposed to all kinds of different avenues in which uh, we would like to at least provide them an opportunity to hear the hope and help that is theirs in, in Jesus as well as 
uh, teach them about some of these health-related issues, too, that can be uh, remedied. This lady that's on the right is one who uh, I think I was moved by the most. Uh, On our last day there, we toured some homes in El Pepinal, and this woman, she uh, makes tortillas, and she walks into a modded lawn to sell them. I think that walk into a modded lawn is like 15 miles down the mountain, you know, crisscross, and then she walks back. Guess how old she is? 85. And she does that to support her family, to, to survive. We took with us some uh, Spanish Bibles as well as some of those palm crosses that are made by the Seward cross makers, and we gave her a Bible and a cross. And she said, thank you so much, through our translator, she said, thank you so much. I have been wanting to read the Bible, but I couldn't find one in Spanish. Well, because she couldn't afford it. That's her way of saying that she couldn't afford it. She couldn't find one. And so God... That was a divine appointment there. And she was so thrilled. I could go on with stories about that of people that we met there. Another another in, in another uh, individual that we met, as I mentioned before, was the mayor of El Pepinal. His name was Robin. And he has a shirt on that says, I can't remember the exact translation, but he has uh, his shirt says that uh, real men love their wives. Because alcoholism is uh, a predominant issue and uh, uh, drug of choice for lots of men in the country of Guatemala. And when they drink, the domestic abuse happens in their homes against their wives. And so he has led the charge to combat that with a group of men that he meets with and, and has surrounded him with in this village of Apep- in El Pepinal. They have outlawed, they have banned alcohol in their village so that they can concentrate on loving their wives and loving their families. They also have a water project that they have worked on to, that's in process to provide clean and safe drinking water for their village, and they would love to have some help in, in completing their community center and uh, doing some things in their school as well as uh, their churches. But on the last day that we were there, that book that he was holding in his hand was... Uh, some uh, uh, a miniature version of a children's Bible. Because Robin has two kids. And uh, we gave that to him as well as a palm cross to share with his kids. And when we gave that to him, his eyes welled up with tears. And he thanked us. And we said, no, no, we thank you for sharing with us. And we look forward to developing this relationship this relationship that we pray will be one that will be continuous throughout the, throughout the years. It won't be just we come once and then you won't see us for four years. Something that will be constant. And as his eyes, his eyes were filled with tears and he said, thank you for giving us hope. You give us hope. So as we talk about first day today being sent ones. Yes, we are sent into our vocations right here in the United States in our community, but yes, also we are sent beyond our borders to other parts of the world as well. We are sent to 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 to, to bring the hope and the help that comes in, in knowing Jesus and to give them uh, this gift of of salvation. It's not again I understand it's not us bringing it to them per se but being the instruments that the Holy Spirit works in and through to to light the spark of faith in their lives. And that's what we get to do. And again I've never seen so many people that have so much joy in them because I think it's really like what Jen said they don't have they're not connected to stuff cuz they don't have any And so when you spend time with them in relationship and you talk about this person, Jesus, that wants a relationship with them and the hope that he has that can bring you for now and for eternity through the forgiveness of sins and the life that that never ends in heaven. Wow. What an opportunity that is. 
to gather with people around the world. And, and, and today, they have their worship gathering in Santa Cruz in the, in the afternoon. But later on today, another part of your forever family will be worshiping at Santa Cruz. About 53. Most of them are, are women. There's only one male there. But they'll be singing the praises of the one who lived and died and lives again. Just like you and I are here today. And they will be hearing the words of hope in Jesus Christ. And so today, we want to offer you an opportunity from the rock to go to Guatemala and, and be Jesus with skin on and bring the, the hope and, and help uh, that Jesus brings to them. This opportunity takes place June 22nd to the 29th. And some of the main activities will be uh, leading VBS activities at, at Santa Cruz. Again, that in English, that's Holy Cross Church at it, on a Monat Lawn Lake. And also leading some workshops and discussions with ages 13 to 20 at the, in the same place as, as well. And when I say leading workshops and discussions or leading VBS activities, it's nothing that you have to have uh, went to college for or to be trained to, to do uh, in advance. Um, if you have a heart for Jesus and a love for people, you're qualified. You are. Because on the first two days when they get there, they'll, they'll instruct and, and, and prepare everything that, that uh, you have to do. I should say that you get to do. And the rest will be left up to the Holy Spirit. God will work in and through you when you're there to impact someone's life for both now and for both and for eternity. So we're going to have an informational and organizational meeting on December 19th. That's a Wednesday night, 7.30, right here in the Rock Cafe. And we pray that that uh, God will, will, will move in uh, a part of the body of Christ here at the Rock to participate in that opportunity to go to Guatemala and be his hands and feet as we are his sent ones. In that first day that we gather to worship, to be energized and charged, to be sent as we are fed from God in order to go out and connect with the people that God dearly loves. And so throughout this series, we've talked about those opportunities. Uh, we started a uh, we, we, we talked today about uh, the first day, right? We said that uh, the, the, the first day, the, the, the theme of this particular uh, message today is to live in community with your forever family. And that just isn't including right here, what we call our forever family here at The Rock. It's expanded beyond this place to those who believe in Jesus as Savior and King. And then we also talked about first dollar, live like you know whose stuff it really is. And then uh, we, we talked about also the first hour, live like you know who's in control. And we started this whole thing off by talking about the first prize, live like you know the rest of the story. And I would encourage you as your final challenge to live, to continue to live out those firsts in your life as you, can, as you prepare to celebrate Christmas, this Advent season. Celebrate the coming of Jesus into our world and also to look forward to his, his second coming, his coming again. Make, it, make some goals in order to keep on track, to stay connected to the vine and produce fruit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunities that you provide for us to work in your world, to be your instruments of grace in its various forms, to people. We thank you first and foremost for that grace that you've poured out on us, calling us to faith in Jesus, and again, the opportunity to live out that faith. Lord, I pray today that uh, through, this, through this opportunity, you will move in the hearts of someone or, or some people that are here, that they would say, Lord, here I am, send me. This we pray in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen.